Good morning. Um, I want to share with you a memory. You see, I still remember the very first class of informatics I had when I was in fifth year of high school, which is now more than 30 years ago. Our teacher walked into the classroom holding a box of chalks. Now, this was still the time when we had these classic chalk boxes with uh, sponges and, uh, and chalks. And we expected him to start talking to us about computers and programming languages. But instead, he asked us how we would find the longest piece of chalk in the box. Now, think about it for a moment. How would you do that? Our first idea was to just take all the pieces of chalk from the box and then put all the pieces next to each other so we could see which one is the longest. But if you have a lot of pieces of chalk of approximately the same length, that's a very difficult thing to do. So we started discussing and we came up with this idea where we just, you just take two pieces of chalk from the box and you look which one is the shortest and you put away the shortest. And then you take another piece of chalk from the box and again, you put away the shortest one. And if you keep on doing that until the box is empty, then in the end, you will be holding the longest piece of chalk in the box. So we had designed our first algorithm. Not a very fast or efficient one, but from there we could move on to make it faster and smarter. And our teacher told us that we would not touch a computer for the first two months. We would just solve problems. And only later, we would learn a programming language as a way to translate those problems in a language that a computer could understand and execute. And that's what fascinated me, when I understood that computing is not about computers. It's not even about specific programming languages. It is about learning abstract ways to think about problems through algorithms and data structures, and then translate them to a means that can be executed by a, a computer. So two years later, I decided to go study computer science. I had never owned a computer, which was at that time less rare than it would be today, but still, I had never spent my afternoons in my room coding and playing games and doing all those things that people associate with computer scientists. I did not fit into the stereotype. But yet, I never regretted taking that path, because it opened so many doors for me. But what really, really bothers me is that now, 30 years later, when so much has evolved, when uh, literally every aspect of our lives is uh, influenced by algorithms and by software, people are still stuck in that same stereotype. They still seem to think that software is some niche activity for a small group of kind of weird people. Um, only a couple of months ago, I was sitting on the train and I was talking to this young man, 20 years old, studying business engineering, and he told me that somebody had given him the advice to take a coding class. But he wasn't sure he was going to do it, because software just wasn't his thing. He didn't find it that interesting, he didn't see the relevance of it, well, today I want to explain to you, convince him and all of you, that software does matter. And I'll do that based on three very simple quotes. And the first one is this, software is eating the world. It's a quote by Mark Andreessen, who was the co-founder of Netscape, which was the dominant web browser in the late 90s and early years 2000. And later, he moved on to become one of the most influential VCs in Silicon Valley, uh, amongst others, an early investor in Facebook uh, and Twitter. And he launched this quote already in 2011, but since then, it has only become more true. What he means by it is that more and more businesses are being run on software and delivered as a software service. And I'll give you some examples. Early examples were um, media and music. Eh? We now all have apps like Spotify that allows us to listen to a vast amount of music instead of having to buy uh, thousands of CDs to have the same amount of music. Now, this was a very uh, a brilliant evolution for, for us as a consumer because we have so much more music to listen to. But it turned around the industry completely. Before this evolution, when we were still buying CDs, musicians made uh, CDs, they went on tour to promote their CDs, but they made money by selling CDs. This is no longer possible. 
So now musicians make albums to promote their tours, but they have to make money by playing concerts and selling merchandising, and etc. And we see it in a lot of domains. For instance, retail, where Amazon and Alibaba, the biggest retailers in the world, are essentially software companies. They are reshaping retail, but Alibaba has no physical stuff, uh, physical stock of stuff that it is selling. It's a software platform that connects buyers and sellers. And we also see it in more traditional uh, industries, like the automotive sector. Under pressure of platforms like Uber or ride-sharing platforms, etc., all the large automotive players are looking on how they can make the transition from selling cars to selling mobility as a service, where you subscribe to an app that allows you to use a car where and when you need one. And of course, they still will need to build cars, but they will no longer make money by selling cars. They will, doing it, they will do it by selling a software-enabled uh, service. And we see this in all possible domains, in education, in healthcare, in agriculture. You see, you'll see a lot of other examples by, by other speakers today, but it's touching every uh, possible domain, both in profit and non-profit because software truly is eating the world. So no matter what field you work in, the organization you work for will in the end become to a large extent a software organization. So you better try to understand how software works and impacts the world. My second quote is this. People now do what companies used to do. It's a quote by Armin Tufana, Tufani, who was a director of strategy at Singularity University. That's a, a global organization that tries to educate and empower people about the new technologies and how to use them to solve societal problems like environment or, or healthcare. And what he means with this quote is that technology has been evolving so fast over the last decades that it has now become all the building blocks are available for people to build new applications very fast. Again, I give some examples. Um, Instagram was founded in 2010, and in 2012, before it launched on Android, it already served 30 million people with only 13 employees. So 13 employees, that's two more than a soccer team, to serve 30 million people, which is about the population of the Benelux. Look at WhatsApp. It was founded in 2009, and before it was acquired by Facebook in 2014, it already served uh, 400 million users with 35 engineers. So 35 engineers, that's about the front row of this room to serve almost the entire population of the uh, European Union. So you no longer need a very large company uh, with an army of engineers to, to build a video streaming uh, application or a traffic management platform or anything, because all these components are now available. And this is visible, for instance, in all the coder doyos and coding camps for kids and teenagers that build real application in a matter of days. Uh, an example last year in Brussels was the, the Gluon Lab, where a group built a particle detector that you can fit onto your bike and then you ride around the city and they build software that maps out which streets are most polluted. And they came up with this idea, uh, thought of how to, to tackle it and then build the application within a week. But it's also visible in the, the rise of all these software startups that you see around you. I think some of them are here uh, today. There were more software startups created in Belgium between 2010 and 2014 than in the 30 years before that. And they still keep coming. And one of the underlying reasons for that is the fact that all these technological components and server capacity and infrastructure you need are available to build your own applications. So I want to stress that I do by no means want to say that it's an easy thing to do to build a full-fledged, reliable application, let alone your own successful software company. It requires a lot of skills, a lot of knowledge, a lot of hard work and perseverance. But if you want to give it a go, all the technology you need um, is there for you. So people can now do what companies used to do because all the technology made all the building blocks available to build solutions now with a group of people 
that 10 years or maybe even five years ago would have required a large company of people. So maybe now you're thinking, uh, but I don't know how to do this. But that's what my third quote is about. But first, let me ask you a question. Who amongst you, when you want to learn a new skill or a new hobby, turns to YouTube for instruction videos? Can't see very well, but it's, I think, at least half of the room. It's what I do, and it's definitely what my kids do. Huh? But this goes for all levels of, of education. And that's what John Chambers is referring to. John Chambers is a former CEO of Cisco, which is one of the largest uh, global uh, technology companies, amongst others, in uh, leading in telecom infrastructure. And he refers to the fact that the internet has made it possible to make top academic content available to all of us. Um, and then we have seen the rise of new platforms offering us this content called MOOCs. And it stands for Massive Open Online Courses. And two of these main platforms were started by Stanford professors in artificial intelligence and robotics who saw that they could only teach their courses to uh, a limited number of students themselves, while the demand for that kind of knowledge was so much bigger. So they started to put their courses online and they noticed that they had people from around the globe performing equally well on their courses as their Stanford students. So they started the platforms Udacity and Coursera and they convinced hundreds of colleagues to put their courses online as well. So you now have hundreds of courses, not only in technology but also in humanities, in uh, business, uh, in languages. And not only can you follow these courses, but you can also earn credentials for those courses that you have successfully completed. And this ranges from single courses to nano degrees to full-fledged masters. And this already is transforming education. One uh, very interesting study was by interviewing.io. Interviewing.io is a software platform, of course, where you can uh, test, doing, test yourself for doing technical job interviews. And when you get really good at it, you can get real job interviews through the platform with companies as Google and Facebook. And the people at interviewing.io studied their data to see if there was a way from the data to predict when they get the real job interviews, who would get the job or who not. And they found that the most predictive factor was not what college or university you went to or how many years of experience you have, it was a number of courses that you successfully completed on Udacity or Coursera. Some of these courses lead straight to jobs. So this is transforming education. It's software eating education. Uh, education as a service where we have all the knowledge available online, the way we have all music available in our Spotify app. So combining the two equalizers, internet and education, has made it possible for anyone to acquire the skills and knowledge he or she needs to achieve their goals. This goes from people across the globe who might otherwise be deprived of this kind of advanced education to anyone who wants to just make a change in their professional life or just learn some new skills. So to summarize, I talked about three things. One is how software is eating the world and it will continue to impact all possible domains over the coming decades. The second is that people can now do what companies used to do because technology has made all these building blocks available for you to build new solutions um, that would 10 years ago have required a big company. And three, Combining the two equalizers of internet and education has made it possible for everyone to learn the skills and gain the knowledge they need to accomplish their goals. So when I think back at this student that I was talking to on the train some time ago, whatever field he'll start working in, it will be impacted by software in the coming decade. So he'd better follow that coding class or read about software and learn how it works if he wants to make an impact. But luckily for him, all the knowledge and all the technology is available. And I would like to reach out especially to all you women and girls out here today. You're missing out on so much fun, but also on so many opportunities and power to make a change. There are places in the world where a large part of computer science students are girls. So there's no need 
why that could not be the case here. And of course, not everybody should study computer science, but sh some of you should try it. And others maybe take a coding class or, or read about software and be part of a team that uses software to make a change. And to all of you, I want to ask to step away of this stereotypical type of what software is. It's not some nerdy activity for the geeky guy at the back of the office. It's completely transforming our society. And computing gives you a language to understand how it works, a language to think about problems in an abstract way and then build solutions. So study computer science, take a coding class, read about how software impacts our society. So that next time when you pick up a piece of chalk, or maybe today it won't be a piece of chalk, it will be a whiteboard marker or a touchscreen pen, but next time, when you start brainstorming about a project, about a challenge that you really care about, that you understand what the possibilities are, that all the opportunities are there, that you embrace the software, and that you go for that moonshot. Thank you.